Hello there, and welcome back to Real Analysis. Uh, in this video lecture, uh, section 1.9, we're going to be talking about um, a notion called density, density of subsets in the real numbers. And in particular, I want to prove that the set of rational numbers are dense in the set of real numbers. Earlier, when we were discussing the completeness axiom, uh, we made some comments in class that the rational numbers, they're, they're a subset of the real numbers, they satisfy all of the field axioms, they satisfy all of the order axioms, but they're different from the real numbers, well, among, for at least among the reason that they didn't satisfy the completeness axiom. And the, uh, that, that is that it's not true that every bounded set of, uh, as every set of rational numbers bounded above has a least upper bound that's a rational number. But the argument for that kind of, uh, to, to establish that fact uh, requ required that there were sort of rational numbers arbitrarily close to that. The, in our example, it was the square root of two. So this density business is, is a way to kind of make precise what I mean by there are rational numbers arbitrarily close to every real number, arbitrarily close in a sense that we're gonna make precise in this lecture, okay? So to get us started here, you're looking at kind of the first slide, and it's just a couple of statements that I think are, are pretty palatable, that, that not every real number is a rational number. Uh, we, we haven't in this course proper given a proof of this yet, but, but perhaps in your uh, Math 240 course using some ideas from number theory, you proved, for example, that the square root of two is, is a real number that's not a rational number, but, but the rational numbers are a proper subset, which is sort of, I'm just emphasizing that here by writing the subset symbol with a, with a not equals under it, it's just to emphasize that there are real numbers that are not rational. And in fact, for example, uh, if we want to keep using the one that we've kind of given without proof, this number that has the property that its square is equal to the number two, it, it's an element of the real numbers, uh, uh, but it's not a rational number. Okay, so, so the rational numbers are a proper subset. But like I was saying in the intro, the rational numbers somehow are arbitrarily close to, to uh, any number you pick in the real numbers. That is, this is kind of a colloquial way of saying this, but the rational numbers are everywhere. They're everywhere in the real numbers. So let's start uh, trying to say what we mean a little bit more precisely by, by phrases like that. So if I scroll down here a little bit, just to start off with sort of an example or a conversation, suppose you take a, a couple of rational numbers, let's call them R1 and R2. So the R I'm using sort of phonetically for rational. Uh, and let's suppose they're distinct and without loss of generality, let's say that the one that's called R1 is smaller. So I've got two rational numbers, R1 and R2. R1 is less than R2. Okay, if you take a look at how you add fractions, how you add rational numbers, so by the definition of rational numbers and the definition of addition in rational numbers, I'm going to omit the details from this video lecture, but you can convince yourself that the sum of two rational numbers is also a rational number. I said this earlier, remember the rational numbers satisfy all the field axioms. <laughs> Uh, so, so in particular, if, if I divide that rational number R1 plus R2 by the, by the rational number two, I also get a rational number. They satisfy the field axioms. Yeah. I'm gonna leave this as either an exercise to you or when we discuss this in, in our Zoom class, maybe we can include the details, but I claim that that number, and I, I think you believe this right away, you can stop the video and kind of scratch out a justification for it. That number R1 plus R2 over two, it's the average, it's the arithmetic mean of the numbers R1 and R2. Uh, it lives right in between R1 and R2, right in the middle. So if I'm kind of visualizing this in our usual way, I've got the real number line drawn down here. R1 and R2 are marked, and by my assumption, R1 is less than R2. This number R1 plus R2 is, is in the middle of them. So um, said another way, between any two rational numbers, I can find a rational number. Right, but then uh, I've already written that this number R1 plus R2 is also rational. So say between it and I'm just gonna arbitrarily pick R1, I could also find a rational number. And then between those two, I could find a rational number. And between those two, I could find a rational number in any one of those intervals. So again, this is a little bit hand wavy or not hand wavy, but, but not, not mathematically precise, but the rational numbers sort of occur everywhere on the real number line. 
all right? So, so I wanna make a definition that makes that a little bit more precise. Here I've gotten, if you, if you wanna stop the video and write down a phrase, uh, uh, the point I was trying to make is that there's a rational number between any two distinct rational numbers, okay? That's kind of the uh, summary of the picture uh, that's above this thing and the argument that I was just trying to give. Between any two distinct rational numbers, there is another rational number. So, so that's kind of a, a slightly more precise way of saying the rational numbers occur, quote unquote, everywhere on the real line. Well, at least assuming you can find a couple of rational numbers. Okay, so let me try to make a definition that we're gonna use to sort of make these ideas a little bit more precise. So I've taken it from your text, it's definition 1.14. It comes from this section 1.9 in our, in our text. And it's uh, defining what I mean by a dense, dense subset of the real line. So that's the main definition. And we're gonna call a subset E, generically this book always likes to call generic subsets of the real line E. So we're gonna continue with that notation. Subset E is called dense, or I think it's more precise to say it's dense in the real numbers. So the subset E is dense in the real numbers. If, if it's the following, for every interval, so there's a universal quantifier here for every, so if for every interval a, b, when I write that, it's implicit in the notation that a and b are real numbers and a is less than b, because that interval is the set of real numbers that are strictly between them. So although it's not specified in the definition, it's always implicit. If I'm talking about the open interval between a and b, I mean a and b are real numbers with a less than b. And the subset e is dense if every open interval a, b contains a point of e. Okay, so, so maybe a slightly uh, a more quantified or variable way to write that is it's dense. So let me just say IE, I'm rephrasing it, it's dense. If for every interval AB, it's the case that that interval, which is a set, intersect the set E is not empty. Okay, so that's sort of an alternate way of phrasing this definition. A set E is dense in the real line if the intersection of E with an arbitrary open interval is never empty. So that's what I mean by a dense subset of the real line. Let's look at a couple of examples. My examples are all kind of negative in the sense that I'm gonna be claiming things are not dense but this is a good exercise for us. Remember my generic advice was anytime somebody gives you a definition, uh, um, you should think about what the negation of the definition means. So, so maybe we should, we should even write it here. I'm gonna kind of interrupt the example, but remember E is not dense in R. Well, what would that mean? Uh, I have to negate this universal quantifier, right? So if it's not dense, there must exist an open interval. A, B, again, it's implicit that A and B are real numbers with A less than B, such that what? Well, that interval does not contain any point of E. So the intersection is empty. Uh, uh, so, sorry, up, up above here, oh darn it, I, it's too late. I, do, I don't wanna edit the video here. I said not empty when I wrote, but I, I wrote it wrong. So please make sure you catch that in your notes if you're watching this, uh, that, that it's dense if the intersection is not empty. <laughs> Sorry about that, but uh, here we're a few minutes into this video and I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to start again. I'm lazy. All right, so it's not dense if there exists an open interval. So I'm negating that universal quantifier uh, on open interval AB where the intersection is empty. Okay, so back to our example, why isn't Z dense in R? Well, uh, here I'm just gonna kind of finish the sentence. Uh, uh, because, for example, I mean, you, you can make up as many uh, examples as you want here, but maybe um, I'll take the interval uh, between one quarter and three quarters, decimal form between 0.25 and 0.75. If I intersect that with the integers, 
I certainly get the empty set. There's no integer between one quarter and three quarters. So the integers are not a dense subset of R. Okay, so there's sort of an example here. I've got a, a second example down here. This set consisting only of the uh, uh, numbers uh, uh, negative three, five, and ten is not dense. Again, you can you can make up uh, a, examples uh, uh, to your heart's content here. But for example, if we wanted just to complete this sentence, let me just take say the number six, and I don't know maybe the number nine. Uh, if I take the open interval between six and nine and I intersect it with that set E, uh, they have nothing in common. That intersection is empty. So that set is not dense. And you could create lots of different examples here. The idea is that you can look at these three numbers, minus three, five, and 10, and kind of calculate the distance between them. And as long as you take open intervals, this length is less than that distance and avoids the points in the set itself, the intersection should be empty. So I'm going to leave it to you or maybe our class discussion to kind of generalize that. Uh, I'm going to just sort of write here that it's kind of an informal exercise. But just like our example E above, no finite set. No finite set can be dense in R. Yeah, there's lots of ways. I mean, I, I, I chose that interval six to nine. I mean, you, you could also think about it. Take an interval, uh, you know, if you give me a finite set, I'm kind of giving you a hint how to prove this. A finite set has to have some maximum element in it. Yeah. So, so take an interval whose endpoints both exceed that maximal element, for example. I don't know. There's lots of different ways you can prove that. I'm going to leave the details to you, but no finite set is dense in R. Okay, so we have this definition, density. Uh, roughly speaking, I mean, the way my intuition kind of thinks about it, a set is dense in R if its elements are sort of everywhere. Everywhere in the sense that any open interval, any interval of any length, and the spirit of it is you should imagine the interval as being short, very tiny, but it cannot avoid the set E. Okay, so that's what density means. So the main theorem of this lecture is that the set of rational numbers is dense. This is the way I want to make more precise that statement that I opened with, that the rational numbers are everywhere. So I'm making that precise and in our language here by stating this theorem, that the set of rational numbers is dense. And again, I mean dense in the real numbers. Okay, it's always implicit, but it doesn't hurt to, to mention that. Cool. So we're going to give a proof. The proof will use a little bit of our uh, Archimedean principles in, in the real numbers. So let's sort of start looking at it here. I've written it out ahead of time to make the conversation flow a little bit uh, and leaving some spacing in case I want to add some comments here. But let's check it out. So let's take any open interval, right? So we have a, we have a definition. A set is dense if every open interval intersects the set uh, in, in, in a non-empty intersection. So I'm gonna start my proof by taking any open interval. I wanna get the right uh, uh, quantifier. So, so let's take any open interval in the real line. And what do we wanna do? Maybe I can write it kind of parenthetically in a different color, it's not part of the proof, but I wanna show that that the WTS is my acronym, want to show that the intersection of that with the rational numbers is not empty. So I want to produce a rational number in the interval from A to B. A and B are arbitrary, right? Like I said, our, con our, our condition, our, our convention rather, when I write an open interval like that, A and B are real numbers with A less than B. So B minus A is a positive number. Yeah, B is bigger than A, so the difference B minus A in that order is greater than zero, follows from our order axioms, okay? So, so I'm going to take advantage of our Archimedean principle, so I'm going to use that Archimedean property of the real numbers. I can find a natural number, I'm going to denote it by the letter N, and that natural number exceeds the reciprocal of B minus A. Right, the Archimedean property says that there's a natural number that is bigger than every real number, and in particular, there's a natural number that's bigger than this reciprocal of b minus a, which just by the way is also a positive number. Okay, b minus a is positive, so so is its reciprocal. Follows from our order axioms. Good. Okay, 
So what are we going to do with that thing? Uh, you can kind of ignore the underlining here for a second, but if I take that inequality, maybe maybe I'm going to underline it to help you uh, see what I'm looking at. If I take that inequality n is greater than one over b minus a, and using the algebraic and order axioms, I can rephrase it uh, as n times b is bigger than n a plus one, n times a plus one. Just multiply both sides by b minus a and do a little bit of arithmetic. Stop the video. It's all justified by the field and order axioms. The green underlining, ignore it. It's, it's so I can kind of refer to this inequality later. It's just an alternative. Instead of numbering it, if I were writing this in a textbook, I might write, okay, this is inequality number one and refer to it later, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna refer to it by color. But you can ignore that for a second. So this is our first sort of sub result that given this a and b, I can find a natural number n so that this underlined in green inequality holds. Okay, then I'm going to use a little bit of the work that you're supplying in the course. You're, you, you've done a homework problem or you're working on a homework problem or will work on it. It's exercise 1.7.4 in the second homework set that says that there's a unique integer, not, not just an integer, but a unique integer, I'm going to call it m, uh, uh, that satisfies that uh, uh, inequality, these inequalities. Okay, that m uh, is, is no more than na plus one, uh, uh, which is uh, less than m plus one. All right, so in other words, uh, uh, if you like, I'll just kind of write it over here again, parenthetically in blue, that na plus one, this real number, it belongs to some interval uh, that that's endpoints are consecutive integers, some half open interval whose endpoints are consecutive integers. This is sort of a alternate way of saying that there is a unique integer less than or equal to uh, na plus one. Okay, it's it's, 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 it's it's you might in other courses you might have called that integer m. It's the floor, it's the integer floor of the number n a plus one. But you're going to prove that that thing exists and is unique in that homework exercise. So I'm going to use your work, and just continue on again, ignoring the color scheme for a second. Those are going to be for referral. So uh, uh, from that inequality or set of inequalities, rather, I'm looking right here when I'm talking about them. Uh, I'm just going to take from the first one, m less than or equal to na plus 1, and subtract 1 from both sides of it. So order axioms say that that's valid, and, and I get this inequality m minus 1 uh, is less than or equal to na, okay? Uh, uh, but na, remember, uh, uh, would always be strictly less than na plus 1, right? Because uh, adding 1 to something increases it. So, so that's what that justifies that inequality. And then the Na plus one is less than Nb. Well, that's from the green thing above. Okay, so, so I'm using uh, uh, this inequality up here. I'm just actually rewriting it. It just looks a little different because I've, I've switched the order in which I've written it. Okay, so I get that string of inequalities. M minus one is less than or equal to N times A. That's this one. Uh, uh, which is strictly less than Na plus 1, which is strictly less than N times B. Stitching all of those things together. The red and the blue colors haven't come into play yet here, but they're going to come into play right now. So uh, I've written out this string of inequalities in the bottom. I just want to kind of justify them, right? So this is sort of the the presentation of an analysis proof often feels like this, but in organizing these inequalities, I certainly had to do uh, tons of scratch work over here on the side. But let's see if we can't try to understand them. So the first one I'm writing uh, uh, is that A is less than M over N. Okay, I've underlined that in red down here and I'm underlining it again in, in the laser pointer because it comes from the inequality that I've underlined in red above here, right? So what are the details? If you want to kind of pause the video and puzzle them out yourself, that's probably better than listening to me. But here, uh, I'm just going to kind of reveal what the way I was thinking about it. Taking this red underlined inequality up here, if I subtract one from both sides, it says that Na is less than M. Yeah. And then I'm just dividing both sides by N. So I get that A is less than M over N, and that's all I claimed. Cool. So there's that one. 
established. How about the blue one? M over N, I claim, is less than or equal to A plus 1 over N. Well, that is justified by the inequality that I've written above that we've already established in blue. Uh, if, if you just divide both sides of this blue up here inequality by N, uh, N, remember, is a positive number. It's a natural number, so, so, so it doesn't change the inequalities. So M over N is, well, N A over N is A, and 1 over N is 1 over N. So, so the blue underlined inequality, uh, and it's not strict, is justified from that. Okay, so there's two of our three, and now the green one. Well, uh, the green one follows from the green one that's written right above it. So this last inequality, it's strict. I'm claiming that A plus one over N is less than B. That follows from the one written above here. Just divide both sides by N, all right? Uh, uh, N is a positive number. You can divide both sides of an inequality by a positive number by our order axioms. So what would we get? We would get A plus one over N is less than B. That's exactly what's written down here, all right? So that's kind of the details of the uh, arithmetic of these inequalities. And now let's just kind of enjoy the punchline. So what have, what have we shown? We've got this number, an integer over a natural number. That's an element of Q by definition. And we've shown that that rational number is strictly bigger than A, but it's strictly less than B. Yeah. So that rational number exactly is an element uh, of the interval between A and B. If I kind of pull out that information and get rid of the noise that we had to use to derive it. This is the inequality string I'm focusing on. So our rational number, m over n, uh, belongs to the interval a, b. That is, uh, uh, this set theoretic statement holds, right? So in particular, it shows that the interval of, uh, that was arbitrary, the interval from a to b intersect q, is not empty. Uh, and if that interval is not empty, then by definition, we've shown that Q is dense in R. Okay, so I'm going to end this video lecture there. Thanks for listening.